Hi, Tara Kiesling here with Together We Will. Um, we're a group of progressives um, meeting with Judge, um, Cincinnati City Council, and soon to be governors, where we'll be meeting with governors starting next week. Um, people running for governor, we're just hoping to give you a little bit more access to your candidates. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question to any of the candidates, feel free to just click on the video, ask your question in the comment. Um, we do ask that no other school board candidates ask questions of this school board candidate. We ask that of everybody to help keep it fair. Again, this is Tara Kiesling with Together We Will. We're waiting for other people to start joining us. Um, and if you enjoy this event, feel free to click like on Together We Will's Facebook page. And we'll be posting other events similar to this. Today we're here with Renee Avia. She's a Cincinnati School Board candidate. Um, and also Betsy and Lindsay with Cincinnati State will be interpreting. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, guys. They're with Cincinnati State. If you'd like to know more about Renee, feel free to visit her website at reneeavia.com. It's R-E-N-E-E-H-E-V-I-A.com. And her Facebook page is Renee Avia Cincinnati. Her Twitter is also Renee Avia, so feel free to follow her on everything if you'd like to stay social. Yes, that'd be great. Renee is a, an Ohio native. Um, her father immigrated from Spain and her mother immigrated from Czechoslovakia. She's the first in her family to graduate from college. Um, she has a BA in Spanish and a BS in education from the University of Cincinnati. Um, she also has a master's degree in educational foundations from UC and an administrative degree from Xavier. Renee has been in the classroom teaching Spanish for 24 years and has been an assistant principal for seven. Renee has collaborated with uh, Sue Casa to bring service learning students to service learning experience to students um, ha and has a national board certification so she's qualified to teach anywhere in the country. She's created a guided study hall where students were taken out of study hall if they were failing or experiencing gaps in learning in the four core subjects. Students improved their grades 85% of the time for math, English, and social studies. Science was 77% improvement during the 2014 school year. So Renee, is there anything that I need in, as way of introduction? As a way of, okay. Yeah. Um, well, you cover the fact that I'm from Canton, Ohio, and my, I grew up in a, in a bilingual home, so I am bilingual. Um, I speak Spanish fluently. Um, I'd say that my grandparents, um, they only graduated, well, they didn't graduate, they made it Grade. So I learned at an early age the, important of, the importance of education and community service and giving back. So I've spent the entire um, 31 years of my life um, in public education and I retired two years ago and so now I want to come back and give, I'm coming back full circle to um, hopefully serve Cincinnati Public Schools again as a board member. So um, you may have touched on this a little bit with that intro. Why do you want to be on the Board of Education? So education is my passion, um, and I've served um, students and parents and communities for the past 31 years. Um, I feel like the Board of Education would uh, give me an opportunity to practice the skills of an effective board member, um, and those skills I've been practicing for the 31 years. And those in include consensus building, being a leader, being a team player, um, building teams, um, making informed decisions, um, being an effective communicator um, and leading effective teams. So um, I think with those skills, I would also be an effective uh, board member. So what are the top challenges facing this, the district and what role will you take um, to overcome those challenges? Um, since I public um, faces various challenges, um, I would say um, first and foremost are charter schools. Um, there's a proliferation now that we have in the city and we need to be able to communicate to the, the, the public, to the parents, that Cincinnati Public Schools is the best place for kids and that charter schools, is not, they're not doing their jobs. So what I've been saying is go to knowyourcharter.com and compare um, any Cincinnati Public School to a charter school and you'll find that Cincinnati, Cincinnati Public Schools outperforms charter schools. So that's, that is a mission that we have to be on as, as Cincinnati Public Schools because we're losing dollars and that affects our funding. Um, another one is um, effective community engagement with um, um, the community 
and also effective communication internally with, um, within CPS. Um, and then the lastly, I would say, um, or they're not really in any particular order, but equity in our system. Um, I know that Cincinnati Public is working on equity. When I taught in Cincinnati Public Schools, I taught at a magnet program. So in 1985, those magnets um, were created, um, and they were created a little bit before that, but they were created um, to desegregate schools. And now what we have um, currently in 2017 are segregated schools. So I, f I think that you know, the challenge to, un to desegregate, desegregate schools is, is one that you know, the board can't tackle alone, so it's going to take a community to do that, but I do feel like equity and budgeting with schools um, is going to be important. So. so equity is a big word that a lot of politicians are using right now, so mm -hmm. I'm wondering what, what does equity mean for our watchers? So equity means that you, you fund according to need. It's not necessarily equal. Um, uh, I, I guess I could compare it to marriage equality, um, you know, when uh, all couples can marry um, and when same-sex couples were able to marry, that means equality. You treat each, each person equally. Um, equity is not that. Equity is about, um, you know, our brown skin and our, and our, and our, our black uh, students and families need more help. Um, and not even, even the, the socioeconomic classes. Um, we need to help them. So that, that, that's the equity that, that we're talking about, is equal access, not, or equity in access. So as a school board member, what are your top priorities and how did you decide what would be a priority for you? Yeah, well obviously those three are my top priorities. Um, so within the charter schools, I believe as a board member, what I can do is be more um, available and accessible to um, the community to explain to them what charter schools are really doing and how they're um, a lie basically to the public. So the public thinks that they're, they're, they're getting a better deal and they're really not. So that's part one. Part two to, the, to why that's a priority for me as a board member is because um, uh, knowing, knowing what goes on in the community with, with, and what's happening with charter schools is, impor is important to pay attention to. Um, so when you go and you vote okay, for politicians, for the school levy that's going to be um, coming up, which, which everyone should support because it's an operating levy um, and it's not going to raise taxes, um, you want to make sure that um, we're, we're um, um, supporting our, our public schools. I also think that, um, I know that we, have, we, we employ a lobbyist, so I would think that it's important for us to go to um, Columbus and speak to the legislature along with our lobbyist, not just send the lobbyist, but also the school members, board members go with them. There's nothing like face to face. When you, when you understand an issue in your heart really strongly and you can communicate it to, a peop, to people, I think that meeting them eye to eye makes a difference. So, um, did I miss anything? I don't, I don't think so. It sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is not a question that we provided you with ahead of time, so maybe a bit of a curveball. Okay. But I'm wondering, so if there are voters out there who maybe don't have kids in the system or right. don't have kids at all, right. why should they care about school board or the school levy? Well, okay. So strong cities need strong schools. And people should care about a school board because a school board sets the policy for the schools and they govern. And the other thing that, that high impact boards should do is get out and talk to the community. So if you don't have kids in school, you went to school, you know what contributions you made as a, as a, as a person to um, the economy and to um, you as being a citizen. So it's important that we continue to educate our kids to raise student achievement so we have a more, uh, higher graduation rates and also kids that can think creatively and um, um, criti and critical think and have critical thinking skills, so they can participate in our democratic, you know, process. So it's important that voters um, vote for school board and support our schools. I agree, and I think it's important for voters to know why it's important for education to matter. Um, no one wants to live in a society where education doesn't matter. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be for everybody? Right. Yeah. Um, it, yes. <laughs> So I'll jump, jump back on. Um, what was the biggest change or improvement you initiated in a previous position, and what specific difficulties did you face? Um, what steps did you take to resolve that, these difficulties? So I'm going to go back when I was an assistant principal. Um, 
we were finding that kids in study halls, okay, weren't utilizing their time in study halls. And it's one of the challenges um, is to help kids manage their time and be productive. So um, when, I, when I saw that as an assistant principal, I said, all right, this is going to be a challenge, but I want to take kids out of study hall, where they're basically not doing anything, and put them into a guided study hall for the specific uh, I guess, you know, subject area that they're failing in or getting D's or, or there's a gap. So um, I communicated with parents, with teachers, with the administration, and teachers agreed. Um, it was kind of hard with parents and, and students because they really didn't want to give up that free time as they considered it free time, but we wanted to say it's study time. So we're going to structure your, your study time into a guided study hall. So that's what we did. So we put teachers um, into one room. Um, so when, it, when a student went there, they had, the, they had access to the four cores. Um, it was very successful. Um, barriers, uh, it was successful because the kids did raise their grades and were able to come out. So once, once, they're, once they completed work and got the tutoring, they were able to leave the guided study hall. A lot of them never came back because they wanted to keep up their grades and not lose their study hall. Um, so they learned about time management and how important it is to use that time during the study hall. Um, I would say that probably Barriers were when kids would you know, push back with their parents and so I would have to talk with parents and, and let them know that this is the best thing for their, their, their students because we're talking about high school, so we're talking about credits, we're talking about you know, you have to graduate so many credits, so um, in the end it worked out well, I think. Plus they're learning skills that they can take and use in life. Time management is a major skill I it use is. every day and most, most people I would assume use every day. Um, what do you want voters to know about the Cincinnati Public Schools Board of Education or about Cincinnati Public Schools in general? Um, so about Cincinnati Public Schools, I would say that um, voters need to know that for the past few years, they have, the, the, uh, the schools have been focused on something called uh, Vision 2020 and My Tomorrow. And they've done a very good job at focusing more attention on excellence, access to, to um, advisory teams and reflection on learning. So those, those are important. Um, the uh, Board of Education, obviously their job is to hire the superintendent and then the treasurer, but also to not only write policy and govern, but also to, to get involved. And I guess that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where I want to be you know, more um, accessible. Um, and I'm not saying get involved in the classrooms, but be more involved in taking a look at the overall piece and going out to the communities and talking with the communities and getting their input and feedback on how are our schools working and, and how are we doing. Um, did I answer the question? I think so. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you're just joining us, we're here with Renee Avia, candidate for Cincinnati School Board. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Renee, feel free to click on the video and add them to the comment section and I will read them live. Uh, so what has your role been in selecting, hiring, evaluating, and dismissing faculty or staff? Or making recommendations to those um, responsible? Right, so as an assistant principal, that's what I did. I, I did interview and hire. Um, I'll make recommendations for, for hiring teachers. Um, I would say that, you know, as a board member, I know that I'm not going to be directly involved in that. But as, as, a, as an administrator, when I did, um, the, the teachers that I interviewed for a global language position, I required that they speak in the language. So if it was a Spanish teacher, French, um, a sign language teacher, um, we had the sign language teacher that, that was in the classroom come and talk with, 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 the, with the candidate. Um, I would like to see CPS do some, um, and, and I'm not ch sure how they, how they do all their hiring. I know that they have um, a, a job fair. But once you get down to your final couple candidates, since we're asking kids to be 21st century learners and collaborate and work in teams, I think that would be important for us to take a look at having a team of teachers, maybe two, sit down with a candidate and say, okay, here is a, here's a, here's a, a lesson, May turn it into a problem solving um, lesson. Or, um, you know, show us, show us how you would solve this, this problem with, with, with your teachers. And so here it is, solve it together. When maybe it's something totally different than a classroom issue, maybe it's something else that has to do with the school. 
Um, I think that you know, a lot of times in interviews you can, you can say a lot of things, but you ha well, how do you demonstrate that before? And I think it's critical right now that we, that we hire teachers that can do that. I would also like to say that I think it's important, you know, I was nationally board certified, and that process to go through national board certification is, was the best um, professional development I had in my entire career. I did it back in 2003, and it lasts 10 years. So basically, a candidate has to, they're tested in their content, but also they're pe tested in pedagogy, and then they have to film themselves three times, and everything, you have to ref watch the video and reflect, and everything is geared towards student achievement, including, including your professional organization. So if you go to a workshop, okay, it's not just go to a workshop and then come back and, oh, I went to a workshop. Here's the handouts. It's how does that workshop affect student achievement, which in turn you know, affects your graduation rate. So I would, I would encourage CPS, and I would, I, would, I would definitely encourage this, that we would try and hire some teachers that are already nationally board certified, or I know that we have a very, um, I guess, I think the average years in, in our staff is six, 16 years in CPS. So I, it's a perfect time for, for now teachers. They've got down their classroom management. They know their, they know their content. They're comfortable. Now's a great time to make them stretch and go for that national board certification. And that would increase you know, our capacity to serve students immensely. Um, I've, I've, so that's, I, believe, I believe in that one. How would you successfully work with the unions? And is there anything you'd like to change about how CPS currently works with unions? I think CPS works pretty well with the unions. Um, I, um, I don't think you know there's anything I would change at the moment. Um, I, I, I would, I would, I would hope that the, that the unions would be hopeful to a change in the interview process, and maybe that would be something that you know they would they would maybe want to have more input in. You know, is how how um, folks are interviewed, or maybe how we find more teachers um, that are board certified. Um, maybe maybe. Um, it's working with them, right? Maybe working, yeah, working with, them, with them. Yeah, maybe working with them is as far as if we do create a culture where um, teachers want to learn more and we'll go through this professional development. That there's a way for them to be. Um, I know there's teacher leaders, and they have there's like you know programs for for teachers to advance their their degree. Um, but I think that the national board does goes, goes above and beyond that because when you get nationally board certified, you can teach anywhere in the United States. You do not have to take any other tests or do any other kind of certification. So, I would think that maybe we could work with the union to bolster that and then create some kind of leadership um, uh, roles for teachers, and that they would be open to that. And they'd still be in the classroom, though. I don't want to take them out of the classroom because that's where they need to be. <laughs> How would you communicate with all stakeholders? Uh, well, um, I'm tech savvy, so and social media savvy, so that would be definitely one way. But I still, I still like the face to face. Um, you know, being an educator, that's what I always did was face to face. Um, and so, for me, um, I, I would love to, you know, go to speaking engagements, um, attend community events. Um, so that's that would that would be how I would I would communicate. Um, they can invite me anywhere, and I'd, I'd show up and we'd talk. Making yourself visible. Making yeah. myself visible, definitely. As a leader within the district, uh, you must often build support for goals and projects from people who do not report to you and over whom you have no direct authority, like parents, community, volunteers. Tell us about a situation where you demonstrated that you can build the, need, the needed support for these kinds of efforts. Mm. So I'll probably have to go back to um, a service learning um, uh, project that I had um, when I first started teaching um, at um, Sycamore um, I saw the need for the kids to they were they kind of existed in a bubble so I wanted them to um, use their Spanish because there's no use in learning a language if you don't use it and also um, connect with the immigrant community here in Cincinnati so um, I reached out to Tsukasa um, I reached out to parents um, of the students um, reached out to um, um, uh, the surrounding um, um, uh, people who supported um, Sukasa, and um, got our kids to go and volunteer there um, in, in any capacity they could. Um, so 
they are, they're still doing that to this, to this day. So that was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Um, so the kids um, are still going to Sukasa and, and helping out there. So I'm pretty proud of that one. That's really cool. Could you tell us more about the service learning with Sukasa? Um, sure. So um, basically what the kids do um, is as if they're, when they're juniors, because what we like to do is they could, uh, they, we wanted them to be able to drive there. So um, they, they're able to leave school early, so they, they have a, a free period at the end of the day. They leave, um, go to Sukasa, and basically there could be tutoring opportunities. It's um, translating opportunities because a lot of times the folks need to make uh, um, uh, phone calls to different organizations. Um, uh, Catholic Charities um, it was one of the organizations that, that um, Sukasa worked with as well. Um, so. Um, Basically, that was it. They were they were able to go and and um, do anything really that they needed. So that's what it basically was: translating and tutoring kids um, in English, or in math or social studies or whatever it was. That sounds like another um, transferable skill to real life. It is. Something, it is working with other people. It's, right, and it's a yeah. real world experience that these kids got to do. That was using their Spanish and you know giving their time and meeting folks that you know needed help um, in the immigrant community. With such a large spectrum of learning abilities um, with students who are considered gifted and, and students with um, individualized education programs, mm -hmm. what will you do to ensure all children in the district get the services they need? So obviously the board has to make sure that the treasurer, right, the treasurer has the, has the purse strings and then the leadership you know, executes, okay, this much money goes here, this much money goes there. So um, I would say that as a board member, I would want to ask those questions and make sure that the people in the leadership, right, if it, we were saying that so much money goes to gifted or uh, uh, the special education program, that we're making sure that it does. So it's, it's, it's oversight. Um, I do know that sometimes, um, you know, special education is a, is a huge um, uh, department in CPS. I think CPS has around 8,000 students that are um, on IEPs, and that's a large community of, of students to serve. Um, and I know that, you know, the case managers are, they, they struggle. I think they have 10 schools. That's a lot of schools for a case manager, especially when you might have, I don't know, 10, 12 kids in one school. So. There's a need there, and um, that, that that one may need more more teachers and more case managers. So, um, what and where is the lowest student to teacher ratio in CPS, and um, what is the highest, or what and where is the highest, and what will you do to lower the student to teacher ratio in schools where it's too high? Um, so that's a toughie because. Um, October is the October, um, the first week of October is usually the, I don't know, maybe it's a Friday, um, is when you have to send your attendance into the state. So um, schools never really know how many people are going to show up because it's a public school. So they, you know, I've been there, so I've seen it. My class size was 22 and now it's, you know, 32. So that's a hard one because it's, you know, there is no, there is no criteria for you to get in. It's a public school, you can come. Um, so I, I, that's, a, that's a hard one. Um, that seems um, really inefficient, but I, school board, there's no way to really affect when you send in attendance to the state, right? No, it's, it's just, no, it's a yeah. statement. Every, everything, almost everything that CPS does, almost everything that every school does in the state of Ohio is a state, state mandate. I mean, there's been, been unfunded mandates since I've gotten into education, which is, was 1985, um, you know. Driver's Ed was a state mandated, mandated thing, you know, so um, that's a tough one, and it's 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 hard because you can't you can't close your doors and you can't say no, right? Right. So and we wouldn't want anybody to either. I, no, yeah. we don't want that. <laughs> so it's just I guess you know forecasting how you know the programs and and, and you know who who's going to go to those programs because now they've opened up some new schools and there's so we're going to have to be really good on forecasting okay what schools are really successful i guess that's that's one thing that we can take a look at and just make sure we have our eyes on those numbers so some of us have seen firsthand the damage that an unfair dress code can do to a girl's self-esteem what we do to ensure gender equal dress codes 
Yeah. When I was an assistant principal, I had to enforce a dress code. And it was one of the most uncomfortable things I had to do. Um, you know, having a girl, you know, stand and put their hands down and the skirt has to be, you know, to their fingertips and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't need to be. Um, you know, um, kids wear clothes, they wear what they wear. You know, I think that I'd like to see um, schools to promote, promote more unity and more school spirit, okay, to have more times when kids can wear crazy things, right? Um, we tried to do that at Sycamore where, you know, it's not just spirit week, but it's more often. Maybe it's, you know, once a month or twice a month where kids can wear clothes backwards, uh, pajamas, um, I don't know, hats, all different kinds of things that, that the students, you know, came up with. Um, it kind of, that kind of takes it away from what you're wearing every day to, you know, let's have some fun with what we dress, you know, and how we dress. Um, but it is an issue because I know that um, the, some of the girls felt really, um, you know, they'd be brought up and, and I'd be okay. Good to see you. And we'd close the door and we'd talk and then I'd let them go. And that was it because it's so embarrassing for them. So. I think it's a tough thing too because not every teacher's standards are always the same. It's kind of just up to the teacher and, yeah. and what the teacher feels about yeah. the dress. Um, the standards are yeah, the standards are all over the place. And how I mean, how are you going to do that? Well, it was, well, this one was you put your hands down, and if you're if it's to the fingertips, then you're good. Yeah. And that's but then what are you going to do? You know, you, you, how do you do that? It's embarrassing, right? Yeah. If you, you eyeball it, and yeah, it was not a not a not a fun part of my job. Uh, well, this kind of leads into the question, do you support the use of school year uniforms? Why or why not? Okay, so um, I support the, the school, okay, because CPS has what now is going to be like 57 schools. I support the school deciding what it's going to be or not. Um, I was at Evanston Academy um, a few weeks back, and their school community decided to have uniforms. So if, if a school community wants to decide that, then I'm all for it. If they don't want, if they don't want a school uniform, then that's fine. So I think that that local control, that school site-based control is very important. So that's, that's where I stand on that one. Well, we have a few questions from the audience here. Sure. So what are your thoughts on the balance of magnet versus neighborhood schools, and is there anything that should be done to strengthen neighborhood schools? Okay. Um, my understanding is through the, the process of their Vision 21 or 2020 and My Tomorrow, they're strengthening neighborhood schools through 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 this 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 um, 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 program, so basically they're looking at excellence, right? Um, the board of ed uh, is looking at excellence, um, um, uh, reflection in, in student learning, and then having um, small advisories for kids. So it's beginning, okay? It's the beginning. They haven't. It's gonna. It's it. There's there's not one, you know, one thing that's gonna be the end all right now. Um, I think that I'd like to see more site-based management. I keep going back to that because when I was on the LSDMC years ago, that's what it was. We picked the principal, yes, but we also had control of some of the monies and how we spent them. And I, th I think that that would be good for the equity in, in the neighborhood schools is to give them some control of, site, of that site-based management and some of the monies. Um, neighborhood schools need to be as strong as every other school. There is just no doubt about it, and so recruiting teachers um, for those for those neighborhood schools, um, having more parent involvement in those neighborhood schools is vital. Um, and one of the things that I remember that I did um, to, to get more parent involvement because I, I was when I was in CPS, and I was up in Heinold, up at Heinold on Baltimore Avenue, um, we needed more parent involvement. So a lot of times, you know, parents who weren't successful in school are not going to go to school because it's an uncomfortable place for them to be. Um, I've talked at length with, with um, parents about this situation over my career. And so we went to them. So if we can have more of our, our, our teachers go to the parents, go to the, the community centers that are in the, in the neighborhood schools, um, or to the rec centers, um, and give some time and meet some of the parents there, it might, it might create more trust. Um, because I think sometimes um, there's some distrust um, um, between, you know, uh, parents and teachers. Um, what else was that? That answered the question. What else was there? Anything um, that should be done to strengthen neighborhood schools, Same. but 
I think yeah. you kind of answered that, um, getting people in the community more Yeah, involved. more more involved and, 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 and having having our um, well, the best teachers should be everywhere. But I think if we can if we can get some more of those nationally board certified teachers in there, you know, I think that, I think that would that would help. So for people in the audience, um, one question that may come up is uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I grew up thinking there was only public school and private school. So now that I'm older, there are all these other terms for it: right. magnet, neighborhood, charter. Um, could you explain some of the differences between these schools? Sure. So. Um, Basically, charter schools, okay, are schools that are for profit. So, if your child comes to um, charter school A, then the dollars, the public dollars that the um, state gives us, um, public schools, travels with that kid. And so, um, so charter schools um, do not operate a lot of under a lot of the same rules as public schools, um, which creates a lot of problems as well. Um, um, vouchers are where the state says, okay, we're going to give you X amount of dollars and you can go wherever you want. You can shop schools. Um, and then public schools is funded by um, 50% here, here in, in, in Cincinnati, levies and state, so 50-50. What's the difference between magnet versus neighborhood? So magnet is you can come from all around the city and you're bused in. Okay, so you, if you live in here in Hyde Park and you want to go down to SCPA, well, your neighborhood school, okay, would be Withrow, but if you don't want to go there, you're going to go to the Magnet, so you, oh. so that's the difference. You go somewhere else, and you don't go to the school that's designated your neighborhood school. So um, here we have Kilgore and um, Hyde Park Elementary, and in other places it's AWL and Evanston. Well, AWL is the magnet, I'm sorry. So if you lived in Evanston, um, you, you could go to Evanston, right? So that's your neighborhood school. Yeah. Um, however, some, some folks um, would want to go to a AWL, so they, they would have to apply. So magnets, I guess you also have to apply to them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have um, quite a few questions from the audience right now. What do you think about public preschool only lasting two to three hours a day with an expensive extended day option? And how do you think that caters to working parents or low-income parents? Yeah. Um, so preschool, two, two or three hours is not virtually nothing. Um, and, you know, obviously higher-income families can afford to have um, um, people take care of their, their kids, and lower-income fam families can't. So there's a real inequity there. Um, we have to find a way in our society to say that kids are important and kids come first um, from preschool all the way to um, 12th grade and I guess once um, everybody's on the same page as that whether we have kids or not um, then we can make some things happen um, so it takes a lot of dialogue and understanding um, because people don't want to pay for other people's kids um, you hear that a lot right um, but um, in all actuality um, we're all rowing in the same boat together and so we got to make the same ship, you know, row in the same direction because we don't want to go backwards. So I would enjoy a dialogue um, where we could find a way to make that happen. Um, and I would think that, you know, everyone listening and everyone who will listen to this would think the same thing. Because we're a community. Yeah, we and are we're a all in it together. <laughs> yes, together we will. So that's the only way. By the way, did you guys know that these people, like, this, they're all volunteers? I thought that, you know, that maybe they had a membership and they, I don't know, they got paid a little bit of money. Nothing. It's all, it's all volunteers. So thank you for volunteering and thank you for volunteering. Yeah. Well, thank Good you stuff. for being here with us. We yeah, appreciate you're it. Welcome. <laughs> Um, it kind of started with a curiosity of the people that run this wanting to know who was running for office and mm -hmm. what that meant and mm -hmm. um, and then putting together that local politics can actually affect your day-to-day -day life more than anything that goes on nationally right. in, in some cases. Right. So anyway, um, what do you think about preschool being taken out of local neighborhood schools and moved to three centralized locations and how does this serve neighborhood families? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, question. Yeah. Well, they, I guess um, you know, having it be centralized is something um, that they had to do on um, the board because they needed room in the other schools. So, 
you know, right now Cincinnati Public Schools is experiencing a good problem. It's a problem, but it's a good problem. So there's more kids coming to our schools, which is wonderful. So we have to find a way to accommodate more kids. Um, we're busting at the seams in some schools, and other schools we're, we're not don't have as many. So we're going to have to rethink how we um, how we do how we get kids to school and where we send kids to school. Um, transportation is huge. Um, I'd like to see us work more with um, the city on transportation. Um, I know that we, we already have a working relationship with them, but we're going to have to address it because it is a it's an issue. Um, you know. It, they did it because they needed the room, and that's that's just the bottom line. So, um, yeah, transportation is a hot topic in this next election. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is. It truly is. Uh, so we have another question from the audience. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing the board in the coming year? Mm. Um. Wow. Well. I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say, thank you for that interpretation. <laughs> I'm going to say, um, there's the biggest challenge. There's, there's, I guess there, I, there may be two. Um, we have a levy coming up. It's an operating levy. It's not going to raise taxes, um, and people have to vote for it. And it has nothing to do with anything else. It doesn't have anything to do with preschool promise or anything. It has to do with passing to the levy. An operating levy um, is one that will be flat. There's no raises and no no tax raise. So um, it's it'll stay flat. Your taxes won't go up um, when you vote for it. Um, so it's important to vote for the operating levy. So that communication and that campaign and that um, that piece is really important. Um, it's also important to know that the current board did a good job in, um, in budgeting um, because um, Ernst and Young said that they, they are stable. So we have a stable school system right now, and that's very important. So that would be, right now, I think one of the most important things that, that's going to happen in this next election. Um, and, and I think um, getting preschool promise right um, is important. Um, separate issue, um, but it's important to get it right, and the board's working on it. So. Um, those are, I think those are, there's a lot of other, I could name a lot, but the levy for me right now I think is number one. It's, it's very important for the folks to vote for the levy because it's not going to raise taxes. I'll say it five times, 20 times, I don't care how many times. <laughs> it's not going to raise taxes and it keeps it even, it keeps everything, keeps it's operating, so it, it keeps funding what is already being funded. So it's um, voting for the levy is basically approving for things to be the same, the same the way it is. So everything continues to be funded the way it is, yes. And it doesn't raise taxes. So um, I guess I'm, I'm hearing about the levy a lot, but I'm, no one's explaining to me why do we have to vote on the levy if, every, if we're just voting on things staying the same? Well, because um, you have to go back to the voters and say that we're gonna, we, we, wanna keep, we wanna keep giving you this money. We wanna keep oh, funding. We wanna, we wanna keep it. So it, it stays there and it doesn't go away. So, you can't just yeah take can, money without saying yeah. Do it. yeah. <laughs> We're gonna keep taking the money without asking you to say yes, please. So at so. some point there was a levy that had a right in 2012. Year, a limit on it. Correct in okay. 2012 there was a there was a, um, a an oper operating levy passed and so it's come around now. It's been five years. It was a five year um, renewal. So it's coming up for renewal again and um, everybody needs to vote for it. So please vote for it. It's good for our schools, it's good for our kids, and we want to raise graduation rates and keep student achievement up, and so we need to have, we need to have that. Um, so I, my question personally is, if this levy doesn't pass, what is the school board's role in whatever happens, the aftermath of whatever happens? So um, if, you know, I can't say exactly um, what, um, what kinds of things would get cut, or what, but there, if there'll be a loss of money. So when there's a loss of money, that means things will have to be, things will have to change. Um, so, and um, hopefully the district wouldn't have to go into state receivership, which means that we don't have any control anymore, the state does. So you don't want that to happen um, ever to a school district. Um, and, if, and if you don't understand that issue, um, then I highly advise you to Google it read about it um, because you do not want Cincinnati Public to go into state receivership. Um, we're on the right track. Um, you're going to get some new board members. Hopefully I'll be one of those. 
and we'll be able to move forward um, with more equity, better community engagement, and keeping the funding, and not fund charter schools, having kids and parents keep their money in CPS um, and not go out to the charter schools that are popping up. Because that, that's part of the problem of, of the funding is that people leave the system and then, you know, we lose money. So then they come back and the money comes back, but then, you know, it, it, we have more problems because then those kids haven't been educated, right? So it's, it's a vicious circle. So, um, so with more students moving into the district, it would be a complete disaster if this levy didn't pass because that would mean less money. Correct. All right. Yeah, we have, yeah, like I don't know how many, I think three, two thousand more kids. So it's important that the levy passes, yeah. So jumping back into the questions, um, what solution do you propose for dealing with bullying beyond a no tolerance policy? Oh, bullying. Um, and then, then also, how should the school board and schools handle situations in which bullying of all kinds, including physical, emotional, and online, occur? Occurs? So, so every every um, school district has to have a, a, a policy. Okay, um, as an assistant principal, when I've dealt with bullying issues, um, you know, EMIS, um, which is a, the the um, student management system. Um, yeah, leadership has to report when there's bullying. So. Part of part of the part of the um, you can have a no no tolerance policy, which is which which we should have. However, a policy is only as good as it's put into effect. So, a coordinated program, okay, in every school, where kids are talking about how they treat each other, using some positive behavior supports for kids, because kids come to us in all different. Um, you know, emotional states. And usually when kids act out and they, they, they're mean to each other and they say ugly things and they do ugly things to each other, it's because their own self-esteem is, is hurting. So when you have positive behavior supports wrapped around kids, um, the model is called PBIS, and you can Google that and take a look at it. Um, PBIS World has a, a lot of resources for parents as well. Um, you, um, when you, when you have that uh, time that you speak with kids and you, you have some positive behavior supports around them, they start to talk about, okay, I need to be kind. I understand that I was um, upset. So I would say that you know every school needs to have a program um, that um, doesn't have to be the exact same one in every school, but something where it's touched on monthly because kids tend to forget about how they treat each other. In, in, in the in the you know the scheme of the school day and how the school life is going, um, a positive behavior system is something that can be done every day in schools. Um, and if you if you Google it, you'll see what I mean and what that is. Um, I uh, worked with um, a student, a fifth grader, as a matter of fact, and he um, he was acting out and he was. A holy terror. I was I was there from uh, January till May this past May. Okay, I, I was an interim assistant principal for a fifth and sixth grade building, and this little fifth grader, you know, was bright. He spent a lot of time in my office. He was you know in school suspensions, and I and I put him out one day. He was out of school suspended, and I finally went to the principal. And I said, you know, this suspension stuff isn't working. It doesn't work. Discipline has to be proactive, um, and proactive meaning okay, you have to have positive words with kids about their behavior. Not negative words all the time. So um, what we did is we, um, the teachers came up with, and this is a positive behavior support system, it's a tier two system, what I'm talking about right now. So we came up with, the teachers had respect and responsibility, and they put in what, what you know this little guy had to do. And the, and the next box, he filled it in. Because kids know when they're misbehaving, and kids know when, when, what, what the behavior is. So he filled it in, I, gave, I empowered him, to, to say what he needed to work on. And then he decided what his mid, mid, uh, midweek um, goal was, or uh, reward was, and what his end week goal was. We did this for eight weeks, okay? Um, the teachers, we all worked on it. Um, he carried around a sheet, uh, filled it out, and uh, the teachers filled it out. A two was he was great on each of the respect, responsibility, and his, his behavior point. A one was, well, you were okay, and a zero was, you completely missed the mark today, you don't, you don't get any points. Well, what did he choose for his midterm uh, reward, or midweek reward? A uh, popsicle. So, easy enough, he got that at lunch. 
Um, and then he just wanted little things. Uh, he wanted time on the on the laptop because you know a lot of schools are going one to one now, right? So time on the laptop, five minutes to play games, and gave him a couple of jelly beans. Okay. Um, next thing was a, f a food ticket, right, to get some extra food at lunch. Um, so all these little things. And after a month, this little guy was not in my office. He was saying, uh, "Yes, ma'am," and "No, ma'am." He w he was able to explain while he was upset because sometimes teachers don't have time to listen and he wanted to be listened to so he was able to, to verbalize that so you know he was he and he was he was a bit of a bully this kid right he was he was bordering on being a rough ruffian out at out at lunch and playing basketball out, out at the playground so he turned it around and because he was empowered and we used some positive behavior supports around him so that's 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 the way we're going to really address bullying in schools is is having that positive um, respectful culture and everybody working on it all together teachers and students the other thing I did um, was, was conflict resolution so conflict resolution is when kids sit down and they talk to each other a lot of times kids came into my office and I was like okay we have an issue let's talk about it and then there was no discipline because they understood how each other how each other felt and so there's no need to have any discipline and then it was over and I didn't have to call parents because they were better and they shook hands and and then I never saw him again. So, more more life skills. It sounds like yeah. setting goals, being self motivated, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. yourself back on track when you get a little off track. Correct. Um, and then also not um, being too hard on yourself when you do get off track. Correct. Um, so we have about ten minutes left in our interview with Renee. She's a candidate for Cincinnati School Board. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Um, just click on the video and leave a comment or leave a question in the comments. Um, we do have one question here from the audience. What about the proposed threats to cut programs that feed our children? And what about the quality of the foods that our children are being served? What, what are your thoughts on those? There's threats to, I didn't know there were threats to cut. That I didn't know about. So I would definitely not be in agreement with that. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, and what about the quality of the foods that our mm. children are being served? And I think this is happening at a national level. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. It's, more nationally than locally. Locally, okay. Um, okay, so obviously good food, okay, is the basis of um, a healthy, uh, I guess, um, day, right? And so you, be one, being able to have some healthy food and then go to school and having healthy food at school is very important. Um, having those choices is also very important. I'm a, I'm a real proponent of we can have them in our schools. I would love for more schools to have gardens so kids could learn about growing food and what that is because, you know, we've lost connection with that, you know, you just go to the store and everything comes in a package. Um, you know, if we, can, if we can have more gardens like that, I think that would be great for kids and, and you know, to, what an experiment that would be, right, um, for kids to actually start growing their own food at school and, and having some of that. Um, I think we should. I think um, we should probably partner with, um, you know, more. Um, I guess, uh, I guess, folks and, and, and food providers that want to provide healthy options for kids. Um, you know, the fried and the. Uh, we. I mean, I fought it at, at Sycamore too. I, it was, you know, where I was as an assistant principal that that kids want, you know, what's not good for them, and because it's good, but they're stuck on sugar. Well, we got to get them off sugar. It's a, it's a it's a tough call. However, I would I definitely 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 support it. I'd like I'd like like I said I'd like to see more kids working more uh, and learning about gardens and growing their own food. I think that would be that would be a bit more powerful. So switching topics a little bit. Hmm. Ohio has no model curriculum for sex education, which leaves the decisions mm -hmm. up to local districts. Mm -hmm. um, comprehensive True. curricula are considered to be the most medically accurate and age-appropriate form of sex education. True. Abstinence-only programs have been proven to be ineffective or even harmful. What will you do to ensure our teens get the best sex education public schools can provide? Yeah, unfortunately, um, the Ohio doesn't have a sex ed curriculum. And so um, I would love for them to have one. Um, I would love for the conversation to happen um, in CPS. It does need to happen, um, but it can't happen in a vacuum. So, um, you know, over the next two, three years, um, 
if I were to be on the board, I would like to have a conversation with parents, with teachers, because it's very important that teachers be involved in this conversation, and also with um, the community at large, right? Um, I'm sure there's, you know, some faith-based, uh, you know, folks that, you know, would have their input as well. They want to, you know, want to have, you know, have their point of view. Um, but so we need to have the conversation, but also we need to take a look at nationally where there are programs that are working in different places. So we would need to take a look at what's working out there and then have a conversation about what do we want for our community. So um, I, would, I would support one. It's just, it, it's a process and um, it should start early. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think fourth, fifth grade is appropriate um, because kids, you know, do understand what their body is and, and, and things are starting to happen. So um, it's important for them to understand it. I believe you me, I, when I went to, I, had, I was in high school my whole life in seventh and eighth grade. When I went to fifth and sixth, it was wonderful. But boy, oh boy, they know a lot. <laughs> they know a lot. <laughs> so um, I, we can't put our head in the sand. So it's, I think it would be important for us to, to have a conversation um, and then look at programs that work and then, you know, roll up our sleeves and let's get to work, right? What kinds of job trainings are being offered by CPS and what kinds of training should be offered? And over time, how will CPS assess what job trainings need, um, w what their needs should be addressed? Wait. Over time, how will CPS assess what job training needs should be addressed? So um, the, the CPS site is, has a plethora of all, all, all kinds of information, just so everybody knows. So for job training. so. Um, basically, what they've done is they, um, uh, CPS starts in the seventh grade and goes to the twelfth grade. So, college and career readiness was a state mandate. All right. So every school district in the state of Ohio has to do something. So CPS um, has um, a seventh through twelve, um, I guess, skills-based um, approach. Okay. Um, when you look at it, there are a few items that are consistent in every grade level. Um, number one is effective communication. Number two is goal setting, okay? Have the kids set goals. Um, another one um, is reflection and reflecting on their own work and their work ethic. Um, I, I believe another one is um, um, evaluating their own productivity. So, you know, and how, how they time manage and how they, how they uh, put things together, you know. So, um, those are all very important skills um, for the for, for getting ready for the job for a job then they also have um, you know some some uh, um, access to you know what are soft skills what are hard skills um, you know what are my technology skills um, uh, how do I build a resume um, what are job interview skills so they have those pieces um, there um, um, and I believe that they're, they're trying to do it through um, some of the classes. Um, I know they also have, um, they've reached out to the business community and they have a, um, where juniors come to, um, and a, uh, I think it was Xavier University hosted it with the, the business community. And so the, so the kids wrote uh, resumes and so they interviewed the business community. It was more like, okay, are you, do, you, do you fit me, right? So it was, it was an interesting take on, on how they did that. Um, so they're starting um, this career readiness piece. Um, it's it's a beginning. So um, I'm all for um, kids also taking a look at because um, college isn't for any, everybody, um, and I understand that. So I'd like to see um, kids come right out of CPS and be ready for you know a job. Look at Ohio Jobs, um, OhioJobs dot com. I think it is. Um, there's graduating right out of high school. I know that uh, you can get a job on Ohio Jobs. It's it's taking a look at it and making sure that you know those those skills you know are practiced um, in high school. And um, so it's it's a process. So they're they're working on it. And I and I would definitely continue to work on that. So our final question for tonight is: What can we do locally to help Cincinnati public schools ensure that we teach all and that funding is distributed equitably? So what can you do to help Cincinnati Public Schools locally? All right, so community learning centers are super important, and not all schools have them yet. So um, the board um, needs to make sure that we get more community learning centers in all the schools. 
Um, our community organizations um, around Cincinnati can help with that by saying we will support the schools and would love to come and serve this community. Um, obviously, vote for the levy, the operating levy, so that's definitely yes. Um, I think, um, you know, going in and visiting schools um, and seeing what's going on, um, there's, there's, there's no reason why the public shouldn't, you know, come in and see. Um, also, um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to see how we can go from, um, I guess, a school like Walnut Hills and maybe um, Woodward, you know, having those two worlds come together in some way. Um, and making that happen is important. Um, whether it's through the LSDMCs meeting together and talking about what, you know, what they do and what each, each one does differently, how they get parent support, um, how they can help each other, I think is important. Um, I also think that um, I love to, I was in charge of a lot of exchange programs when I was um, a teacher um, with um, Mexico and Spain. And so I think it'd be a really cool idea to have kids have kind of an exchange. So if you go to Walnut and you go to Woodward um, and it's summertime and there's, I don't know, a, a time where, where, you know, we can have those kids hanging out together and, and they're either at some kind of event that a community sponsors, uh, that would be great. Um, we don't have enough communication that way between kids. And I think that if kids talk to each other, they're going to find they have more in common and more differences. So I think that that would be a great way where um, maybe our community organizations can start helping that happen is to have kids from different backgrounds um, develop some cultural competence um, to understand kids from west side, east side, north side, south side, <laughs> all sides, because we're all around in the same boat. And there's so many different facets to the city of Cincinnati, so many different neighborhoods, Correct. so many different kinds of Correct. people. And we tend, to, we tend to kind of stay where we're comfortable. And the challenge that, you know, we have as a society is to mix and to understand each other and to come together. So I would, I would say that's the challenge. So let's do it. I'm ready. So we're here with Renee Avia. She's a candidate for Cincinnati School Board. The election is in November, on November 7th. Yes, it is. That's important. No. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. Don't Put miss it in your it. calendar now. Um, if you'd like to know more about Renee, visit her website at reneeavia.com. It's R E N E E H E V I A dot com. Sorry if I went too fast. Big thank you to Lindsay and Betsy, our interpreters thank from you. Cincinnati State, and thank you, Renee, for being here. And thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to say to wrap uh, it up? To wrap it up, no. I just just make sure you vote. Um, hopefully, I've, I can earn your vote and be on the board. Um, I'd love the chance to serve um, the community and the students and, and parents of, of CPS. And thank you, um, together we will, for doing your job and volunteering. I love it. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>